creative, innovative ways of meditating. Sometimes people say, oh, I can't meditate. What they mean is they can't watch their breathing. I can't meditate because I'm too tired, I fall asleep. What's wrong with falling asleep? If more people fell asleep, there'd be less problems. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the fact that there was one gentleman who once said that, you know, about his death, he says, I want to die in my sleep like my grandfather. Not kicking and screaming and shouting like all the people in the bus he was driving at the time. <laughs> But, seriously, the, um, sometimes people say they can't meditate, it's too noisy, and somebody sort of makes a noise, they cough, and they complain, what did they, comp what did they cough for? It, it disturbed me. I had a, a sneeze, I had a pain, and they think that the only time you can meditate is when you're in this perfect situation, when we've got the perfect silence, the perfect health, the perfect temperature, and such places don't exist. There's always disturbances if you're looking for something else, looking for perfection. But the real world, the real world is you can't control it, but you can be with it. And you find if you stop fighting, or demanding or arguing with the reality right in front of you with your eyes closed. You just let it be. Mindful. Which means, what does mindfulness mean? It means for me that you are right in this moment giving importance to whatever is right in front of your mind with your eyes closed. Which means you can always meditate. Meditative, meditative is not having this object or that object in front of you. It's how you relate to whatever this is. Being with it, rather than fighting it. Rather than making a battle with it, with all these shoulds and should nots. Giving this moment importance and caring for it. Caring is another way of creating this seed of happiness with this moment. So you can meditate anywhere, any place, if you have the right understanding of what meditation is. Meditation isn't just watching your breath, or watching your body, <coughs> or experiencing you know, deep nimittas. It is lessening your, what they call the panchaniwana, the five hindrances. What are the five hindrances? Wanting something else not wanting what you have, the restlessness which comes from just too much wanting, and the tiredness, sloth and torpor, and the doubt, not understanding how to find peace. So little by little, you get the message, kindfulness. But, the meaning of the, the talk this evening is supposed to be about peace. And how can we find peace and the happiness of peace when we're always fighting wars? We're always trying to get something. This, when somebody asked me once in Singapore, they said they're off to work, they wanted to find out what Buddhism means in five minutes. So sometimes I like being challenged, because sometimes you, the challenge makes you think outside the box, and there's a little cartoon we have over in Bodhinyana Monastery. The only time you should not think outside the box, there's this gentleman who's going off to work, and he talked to his cat, pointing at the litter box. Cat, never think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise the cat poos on the floor. <laughs> but, uh, so most of the time, just, you know, that he wanted something quick, so I had to sort of innovate. And just basic teachings that suffering, disappointment, frustration 
is asking from this world something it can never give you. Asking from this world something it can never give you. And we spend a lot of time asking from this world things which it cannot supply. That's called the lack of happiness, the lack of peace. And sometimes that I ask people to, to contemplate, remember the happiest time you've ever experienced in your life so far. When you felt most comfortable, contented, at peace, where was it, when was it? And you'll probably recall a time it wasn't when you were exhilarated and excited. It wasn't even perfect weather. It was a time when you were with a few people and you thought, I don't want to be anywhere else rather than that moment with these people. It was a moment with any sort of, you know, you still got your work problems and financial problems, whatever. But in those moments, you didn't want to be anywhere else with anybody else, just there. The reason they were content, because they were happy, they were very deep happiness, because something was missing, wanting. You're just happy to be here, even though it wasn't perfect. And indeed, summary of the talk at the beginning, when you want something more, you cannot appreciate what you already have. Your partner, when you want something more, you're not appreciating him or her. Your life, your contentment, your, your happiness, weather, whatever, when you want it to be different, you will always be suffering, wanting something more. I first learned this when I was at school, because I was doing pretty well at school, but I liked playing soccer. I spent most of my time, this before school, uh, morning break, lunch time, after break and after school, on weekends, playing football with my friends. But, you know, you had something called O-levels. <laughs> and my parents and my teachers said, forget kicking a ball, study hard doing your O-levels. Because if you do well and pass many O-levels, then you'll be happy. That's what they told me. The secret of happiness was <laughs> O-level. <laughs> Qualifications. And I was very trusting. So I gave up kicking a football. I could have you know, played for some big team. And you just play, if you just play one year in a big Premier League club, you have enough money, you don't have to get degrees anymore. <laughs> I don't, they, they, hundreds of thousands of games sometimes, these players get. How much do you get for being a professor at Oxford? <laughs> Probably in one game you earn much more than you get for ten years, being a professor in this joint. But, so they said, no, no, no. You study hard. Be much happier. Okay, I believe them. My problem was I did well. And so I had to do A-levels next. <laughs> Have you ever noticed, if you pass an exam, you've got another one to do next? <laughs> They're endless. But as soon as you fail, you're out of it, so you can enjoy yourself, be peaceful. You know, parents don't like me telling that to their kids. And anyway, I tell them, you know, especially, you know, Thai, Sri Lankans, uh, even uh, Malaysian, Singaporeans, I said, tell them, if your children if your son or daughter comes in the top 5% or bottom 5% in the O levels at exam time, you're a very bad Buddhist parent. You're not Buddhist. Because in Buddhism we believe in the middle way. <laughs> Go in the middle somewhere. <laughs> they don't like me saying that either. But you know. <laughs> I was a school teacher for one year and I was mostly teaching maths. Any maths professors here? Math lecturers? Are you good at maths? 
I'll give you a test. <laughs> Listen carefully. Now, any Sri Lankans here, you know that this was very important because Buddhism came to Sri Lanka when the monk Mahinda, Arhat Mahinda, he gave a riddle to the then king, King Pianampiatis. And the king, he answered the riddle and the Buddhist monk said, okay, this country is intelligent enough to have Buddhism. So I'm going to find out if Oxford is intelligent enough <laughs> to have a good Buddhist nun. Listen carefully. 30 cows in a field. 28 chickens. How many didn't? How many did not? 30 cows. <laughs> 30 cows in a field. 28 chickens. How many didn't? Uh, 22. No. Come on, this is Oxford. Oxford College. Come on. Who said 10? Okay, you qualify. <laughs> Because of you, we'll let Bikuni Chanda stay in Oxford. Don't you understand? Like I'll say it slowly. 30 cows in a field, 28 chickens. How many did not eat chickens? <laughs> yeah, oh. <laughs> Not I've ever seen a cow eat a chicken, but nevertheless. <laughs> but anyway, I'm glad you didn't get that question in A-levels. But anyway, I had to, I had to study really hard. At that time I wasn't chasing a football, I was chasing girls. And then my mother and, actually my father had passed away by then. My mother and teachers said, you study hard. You do your homework because if you pass your A-levels, then you can go to university. You get a university degree, then you'll be happy. So that's what I did. I believed them. I studied really hard. And I went to a big college in Cambridge. Was I happy? No. <laughs> More exams. <laughs> Harder exams this time. But again, wow, going to a good college, you know, like Wolfson or over in Cambridge, if you study hard, I went to Emmanuel College, and I'm, I'm going to just a little bit of, of uh, juicy information, because one of the people in Cambridge, he became the Bishop of Southwark, and he looked through the archives, because in the college I went to Emmanuel, one of its famous alumni was John Harvard, who founded Harvard University. And many people don't know this, it's absolutely true, that John Harvard's family lived in the south of London, in Southwark. At that time, north of the river was controlled by the Bishop of Westminster. This was a very time when you couldn't do any naughty business at all. But south of the river, especially Southwark, that was under the control of the Bishop of Winchester, which was a long way away. So out of sight, out of mind, all of the, the, uh, the bars, the gambling dens, the, please excuse me, the, the brothels, they were always south of the river. And John Harvard's family had almost a franchise of all of the red light activities <laughs> south of the river. Because, so at every Friday night, Saturday night, whatever it was, all the Londoners crossed London Bridge to Southwark you know, to have their, you know, their vices. And that's where John Harvard's father and family made a lot of money on the wages of sin, as you recall. He was up at Cambridge. He was a Puritan following that movement. He really looked down upon his family. Then the, the plague came, the Black Death. And all his family died and he inherited all of the money and he went to United States to Boston 
where he founded a college, Harvard University, built on the wages of sin. <laughs> but that's actually true. You've got the evidence behind that. So, the most liberal college, trying to encourage all their graduates to be moral and good and, and socially progressive, the origins were something very different. What were the origins of Wolfson College? Does anybody know? I better shut up, otherwise they'll bad me from here. But anyway, so, study hard, and then you'll do well. And that was the time I started to become suspicious. <laughs> if you pass your degree, do you become happy? And I actually did see squalled on the walls of the you know, philosophy department, exams kill by degrees. <laughs> And there's something true to that, because all we really learn is how to pass the exams. We don't learn you know, to explore, and have the freedom to challenge, and the freedom to think differently, otherwise you fail. So, a lot of the time you do, the degrees stop innovation and inquiry. So I start to become suspicious. Those people who passed, are they happy? And I knew enough professors, they weren't happy. In fact, when you pass your degree, you have to do another degree, a master's. And after, totally sexist, masters, they don't have any mistresses. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a mistress of art? <laughs> anyway, then you have to do a PhD, and then there's always other PhDs to do. And unfortunately, it's endless. And anyway, so if you leave university, you've got qualifications, you get a job. And then I know a lot of people who, they left university, they were working hard. What for? To get a car, to get a place to stay. And then they go into real trouble when they fell in love. Because when you fell in love, that's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. I know a lot of friends even now, they just... They just, uh, they save up, save up, and they fall in love. Within a year, it's all gone. <laughs> Honest, and this is what they tell me anyway. So anyway, then you get married. That really costs. You've got to get a house. You've got to get, you know, furnished. People go in debt. They're already in debt to be a student, but then you get in more debt. And then they have a baby. And that's, they're really stuck there for many years. <laughs> <laughs> and then, eventually, the kid grows up. They're supposed to leave home, do they leave home? <laughs> no, if they do leave home, they you know, try to get some place you know, where they can either start a business or have a house for themselves, and they use the bank of mum and dad. No interest, and all the mum and dad hard work all goes to their kids, because they love them. And so, mum and dad start to think, okay, when I retire, and I don't have to work anymore, don't have to support my kids, then I can be happy. But are they happy once they retire? Because I remember just going to all the churches, all the Buddhist temples, traditional Buddhist temples, and even sort of mosques, and, uh, and synagogues. Have you ever noticed that most of the people who go to those churches regularly are old people? I think, why? Because they believe that they go to that church to get enough times that when they die, then they'll be happy. <laughs> Just like my father, past your own levels, and then you'd be happy. And I got suspicious. I want some proof now. Why can't we have some happiness now? It's always in the future. Once we fix up the Brexit deal, then England will be happy. <laughs> Once we pay off the national debt, then we'll be happy. Once we get rid of this person, then we'll be happy. Have you ever noticed that how happiness is always too far in the future? And how many people know what happiness is? What is this happiness which we're always working hard for to get in the future? So that is something which was always a challenge for me. And I got 
to start to see when there's those moments of happiness, real happiness. Because every time people said, you need some more, you need to change, you need to improve, there's no happiness anymore. There was a separation. This lady came to see me some time ago, and she put it very, very um, eloquently. Oops. See, shed, I'll just hold it on here for a moment, just for a moment, because I have to use both my hands for this. <laughs> she said, this is my problem. This is where I know I should be in life. This is where I deserve to be. This is... Oh, <laughs> Heavenly music. <laughs> well, I, should, I should have mentioned to you that anyone's mobile phones or devices goes off during a Buddhist talk, the mobile phone <laughs> makes bad karma. <laughs> even we believe in karma, even technology has karmic rewards. So anything which a phone goes off during a public talk like this, in its next reincarnation, it will be reborn as a parking meter. <laughs> <laughs> which is a large form of technology. <laughs> IT. So don't do that to your mobile phone. It deserves much better reincarnation than that. The other thing it might, which is right down there with, with the lower levels of incarnation with technology with parking meters, is speed cameras. <laughs> so that phone will probably be bought as a speed camera, so it's too late now. <laughs> so anyway. So anyway, when we get to to where was I with? Oh yeah, up here, here. Yeah, okay, thank you. This said, this is where I know I can be in my life. I'm aspiring for this. I know I can do this. I can get there. But this is where I always am. And I try so hard, and then I get close, but then I go down again. And this is my life. This is where I am. This is where I know where I should be. Either in monastic life, my meditation, my relationships, my health. It's such a struggle. I said, Madam, it's so easy to know the, know the solution to that. Why can't you see it? This is where you want to be. This is where you are. And you just can't get up here to where you know you should be. How about taking off this should? Where you want to be is where you are. Problem solved. <laughs> Content, happy. No. You don't agree with me? <laughs> then you'll be struggling for the rest of your life. <laughs> we always want to be somewhere else. Somewhere. You can go underground, then you will be happy forever. Excellent. <laughs> Why do you want to be better? People spend their whole life trying to improve. And that just makes them more tense. Because we can't be perfect, so we at least we can be better. No, there is a lovely thing about what perfection is. Have you ever heard the saying, nobody is perfect? Yeah, everybody says that. Yeah, nobody is perfect, so when you realise you're a nobody, then that means you're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> if you try and be somebody, then you're in big trouble. That's my problem, I know I'm somebody, not nobody. Oh. So would you recognise me? No, if you're somebody, you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so disappear and be a nobody. Yeah, well, you want to be in trouble? Well, I'll, I'll come up with that. <laughs> <You wanna be, laughs> this talk is about happiness and the happiness through peace, not through struggle. So most people struggle so that when they get to some place where they don't really know where it is anyway, they think then they'll be happy. And happiness is somewhere in the future. And sometimes I always struggle with that. And it doesn't make sense to me. But then, every now and again, you remember what the happiest times of your life are. When you are really happy. And it doesn't mean you have to be even wealthy. You now there was this, this lawyer. You know, he's, you know, he knew that he was dying. He knew he can't take all his wealth with him. But he thought of loopholes. That's what lawyers do. Find a loophole. So he was in his deathbed, thinking, thinking, contemplating, and he thought of this loophole, so he could take it with him. 
So he told his wife his last wish, just get as much cash out of the bank as you possibly can, the, the money's in there, in euros, which is the biggest um, currency note you can have, pack it in two big suitcases and put it in the attic, just above my bed. <laughs> so that when I die, as I go up, I can grab the suitcases <laughs> and take it with me. <laughs> nice idea. But, then his wife followed his instructions, got as much money, millions of euros, and put it sort of right above his bed. And then he died the next day. And after a couple of days, you know, just she went in the attic to check. Of course, those suitcases were still there. And she said, I should have told him, stupid husband, if he'd have put the money not in the attic, but in the room underneath. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know where he was going. <laughs> That's only a joke. But sometimes the happiest moments, you don't need anything to be happy. Sometimes I used to see, when I first went over to the northeast of Thailand in 1970, what was it, four or three or four or something? And in those days, it was just a, a subsistence economy. They never had any money, they just they got the fish from the lakes the rice, and just, they didn't have any money to spend. None at all. But I saw so many people, some of the most happiest of people. And I remember going into the village, one of the memories which I'll, I'll always take with me, going into the village for some ceremony, and going past one of the old houses. And in that house, it was built on stilts, with a water buffalo underneath and an open area at the front. This was at night time. And they had one light, no electric, no electricity in the village, and dirt roads, and there was a kerosene and a rag stuffed through the top of a toothpaste tube, which they lit. And it wasn't that efficient, but the smoke kept the mosquitoes away and the light managed to show this semicircle of faces from old grandparents to really young children, uncles and aunties and cousins all living in the same house. And had this beautiful, warm glow over their faces as they were telling stories to one another. Old stories, many untrue, some repeats, <laughs> every evening they would spend like that together. And when I saw that and realised that how I had spent my evenings in a house watching TV, arguing, not connecting with my family as much as they did, I realised some of the real secrets of happiness, which I'd lost. Searching for happiness, I didn't realise how in simple things the happiness was already there. I've missed out, and you didn't need anything. And now, you know, especially in Australia, have big houses, we've got lots of land. And those houses destroy families. <coughs> I did read this article, there was a lady here in UK who won the national lottery, which was 42 million pounds sterling. 42 million. And so what she did, she bought a house, a mansion in Sussex. One year later she sold it, at a loss, and bought a small two up, two down, terrace house. And it was such a weird thing, that she had a mansion, sold it, and moved into a two by two, that they had an interview of her. Why do you do that? He said, because it was destroying my family. I could never find my son, who was in one couple of rooms of the house. Never saw my daughter, who was in her rooms. Never saw my husband, 
It was somewhere else in the house. It was such a huge house. It was separating everybody. He said, I, I never saw my husband. I lost my kids. The, the big house, and they never had to live together in close proximity. And I always thought that in many places, in poor places, where sometimes you have three or four kids growing up sleeping in the same bed, they get to know how to get on with one another, to learn the secret of love and tolerance. Now, because we have our own rooms, we don't have to learn how to put up with one another. You understand now why sometimes the divorce rate gets up? Because we've lost the art of loving. Loving doesn't mean getting what you want. It means learning. It's how to be with other people, even if they're sometimes irritating. This is one of the reasons why when I went over to that poor part of the world, were they really poor? It redefined my ideas of what poverty is. They didn't have any money, they had just no electricity. And my goodness, they were some of the happiest people I'd ever seen. Laughing so easily, cracking jokes, having very few worries. A lot of times this is where he realized some of what happiness really is. Is England a happy country? <coughs> Have we lost our happiness? What is our happiness? And sometimes you ask yourself, don't believe a monk like me, when you were happy, the happiest moments of your childhood. Sometimes it was doing nothing, I didn't need anything. Just playing around with a couple of sticks, with a ball, kicking it around, having good fun. I didn't need to have any qualifications for that. Sometimes it destroyed those. Qualifications destroyed those. But anyway, in this particular case, we always think we need something to be happy. Instead of realizing, letting go of things, simplicity, gives you much more happiness. Weird, why am I a monk? Why is Venerable Chanda a nun? We're not desperate, you know, we're not stupid. There are so many people highly successful in their life, sorry, highly successful in their life, who nevertheless realize it's not fulfilling. For me, one of the things which I did was always understood this Buddhism was actually going against the grain, it was challenging me. And especially when you started to do some meditation. At the time, I had a girlfriend, we were having, please excuse me, but I have to say this, having really good sex together. <laughs> and, just, I don't know why people laugh and giggle about that, it's, I was a human being, I wasn't born a monk. <laughs> and, just on one occasion, she lived over in Gloucester, and I just went, to go for my first meditation retreat. And it blew me away. The peace, the happiness, the sheer joy of letting go of meditation was much more pleasurable than good sex. Lasted longer and didn't have any of these complications, the sticky contemplations of attachments or even pregnancy. And that was why, honestly, my uh, response to that was, why hasn't anybody told me about this before? It was like fluking a deep meditation, which can only occur when you totally abandon the past and the future. You don't want anything, not fighting anything. Your mind becomes incredibly peaceful. I've got this here, oh, I have to, 15 minutes, I have to talk, then questions. This glass of water, how do I bring this to peacefulness, to make it still? Many people meditate, okay? Meditate, become still. Has it become still yet? I'm not paying attention, am I? I'm not mindful, I'm not going to be mindful. I'm mindful of this water. My goal is to get this to be still. 
Uh, can you stay? You're, are you honest? No. <laughs> no. <Mark. laughs> Stop acting like me. <laughs> no. I, I'm being mindful. Is it stop moving yet? No. Because I'm not concentrating. I now concentrate. <laughs> I'm really trying to concentrate. You know when you get concentrate, you get disturbed? It's and also, yeah, it's weird. When you concentrate, it actually moves more. So for years, <laughs> for years, I tried to meditate like this, trying to hold my mind still, it got worse. Until he, we had a great teacher, like Ajahn Chah, he used to tell us, we meditate not to attain things, but to let go of things. What does that mean? If I don't try and attain something, I never get anywhere in life. Let go of things. Then you realise. You let it go. You put it down. You can wait for a few seconds. It's pretty good now. How still is that? Perfectly still and perfectly easy. <laughs> that is how you meditate to get bliss. You know what most people do? They say, okay, hold it still, it doesn't work. Okay, be mindful, it doesn't work. Put it down. They put it down. Is it still here? Oh, yeah. Come on, have a look all day. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's not still. Wait for a while. What happens when you get still, when you let go? A good way of looking at this is two parts to the human mind. The active part, which I call the doer. The passive mind, called the knower, is actually real mindfulness. Just being aware, not interfering, not wanting anything, not disturbing anything, just knowing. That's the passive part of the mind. The active part of the mind is which does something, thinks about things, makes plans, argues, which does stuff. And it's very rare to see a person who just lets things be and doesn't interfere. I go to many countries in the world, many cities, it's very hard very rare for me to witness a human being. Whether in Bangkok or Singapore or Hong Kong or in London, there are very few human beings in London. A lot of human going places and doing stuff, but very few actually being here. They're human goings, human doings, not human beings. But if you just let go for a little while, what happens is all the energy of the mind, lots of energy, which gets wasted on doing stuff, on arguing with the world, on fighting with the world, on planning, complaining, holding old memories, all of that stuff consumes so much of your energy. Which is why when people strive and struggle, they get exhausted. They've got hardly any energy left, which is when they get dull and depressed. Because what happens when you're really fighting, struggling to meet a deadline, struggling to stop something happening, struggling and arguing so much, that wastes a huge amount of energy. When you get angry, you feel alive when you get angry, but it consumes so much of energy. And afterwards, and you get frustrated. You give up, you get depressed. All because you're wasting energy. But in meditation, you learn how to let things be. Put things down, stop struggling. The strange thing happens. Your energy, instead of being wasted in fighting the world, in doing stuff, starts to pour into the passive mind, the knower. And your knower starts to wake up you know what the word Buddha means? It comes from the verb bhujati, which means to waken up. 
to be awake. Many people think, I'm awake, I'm not asleep, ha ha ha. You're half awake, maybe not even that amount. You get used to this. But what happens when you stop struggling and striving? Energy goes into knowing. And you really do wake up. What does that mean? You start to see things with greater fullness and richness. I can't resist this story which was true, but it's gross, which is why you will remember it. When I was on one retreat, teaching the retreat, I had some really good meditation, I know how to let go and leave things alone. It's like in huge amounts of energy. So much energy pouring into your mindfulness that everything you see becomes rich. As the 17th century poet and artist William Blake once wrote, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour. To see a world in a grain of sand. How can you do that? Not in a microscope. The mind is so still, so much energy. You're really awake and you see incredible stuff. And a little flower, you see a whole heaven in there. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity in an hour. <coughs> Buddha said eternity in a moment, in the now, but doesn't rhyme with flower. <laughs> so anyway, there. That fellow has some idea of what I call superpower mindfulness. Born of stillness, we really wake up. And for me, what happened? It's a gross story, but it's true, with no exaggeration. After the deep meditation, really blissed out, had to go to the toilet to do what we call a number two. You know what I did? I went in there. Afterwards, I was so blissed out, I had a look in the toilet bowl. Never in my life had I seen such a beautiful piece of shit. <laughs> now, you may laugh because, you know, you're conditioned to think this is disgusting. And you look at it as disgusting, you expect it to be disgusting, but I was so free in a way. Just, the, it's not one colour of brown. It's many different shades of brown. <laughs> and I know some people, it's probably the is a saucy, naughty novel called Fifty Shades of Brown. <laughs> Sorry about that. But anyway, this was so many different colours, shades of brown. It's not just a uniform colour. And just the way that they interacted together, you know, the darker browns, the lighter browns, the middle ones. It was like some artist that painted this. And just the way, if you ever looked at this, it's different little balls all stuck together. Just like... <laughs> It was like a sculpture, you'd expect it to roll down, or even a Michelangelo, I don't know. And just the whole thing was just so perfectly balanced and interacted. And when you came to like the, the aroma... <laughs> now many people, they think that, you know, the smell of a rose, or some um, Chanel number no. 5, but that's so artificial, that's not real, that's not earthy. It doesn't speak of the basics of life. This was full and real, not plastic. This was so natural. You'd expect someone who's environmentally sensitive to really appreciate this. And I was smelling, oh, this is amazing. And it's so beautiful. And I was just going, sitting there going, wow, wow, this is incredible. And I did even think, honestly, of picking it up and showing my friends. <laughs> I mean, when you see something really beautiful and wonderful, don't you like to share it with your friends? <laughs> but it's only because, only because I've been trained so long in letting go. It was a tough one. <laughs> but I managed to do it. I can't. Come on, little buddy, you know, you've got to press the button. And the most beautiful turd in my life went out forever. <laughs> Gone. That was renunciation. But that wasn't an exaggeration. To actually be able to, to see something so beautiful, so happy, through stillness, through peace. Now you can understand, when you have that degree of peace, your mind becomes empowered. Whatever you see becomes beautiful. 
You look at the floor. It's amazing the different colours of brown there. Just the way it all works together. You start to see beauty, interest in places you never expected before. Happiness in the gross is happiness in the ordinary. When you're at peace with yourself and life, you get some amazing insights into how, what do you want to change for? You're really beautiful enough, you're at peace with yourself. How can you ever find peace with yourself if you always want to change something? Just like those exams, there's always something else to change afterwards. But when you learn how to you know, do things which are quite challenging, go against the grain. See beauty in something where you never expected to find beauty. So after a while, you find that you're sitting here with your eyes closed, and you're just watching the hour, watching the breath for a couple of hours. Everyone, how on earth, earth you could do that? How many of you can watch a football match for a couple of hours? Do you fall asleep? Do you get sort of distracted? How many of you can watch a movie for three hours? Is it a struggle for you? Do you have to say, I've got to watch this movie, I really have to? <laughs> of course not. You have one-pointedness, focus, without any striving, because you're enjoying what you're doing. When you really focus and get some joy up, some strong mindfulness, you can meditate for hours. No problem at all. Enjoying every moment. Blissing out. I don't know why it is. People say, oh, you get attached to happiness. Where did that idea come from? Why are people afraid of happiness and joy? A lot of times we are. One person we were talking about this a couple of hours ago, she was a nun. In my mind, she was getting so deep in meditation, it was really on the edge of what we call the jhanas, deep states of bliss. But she couldn't make that final letting go to enter that bliss. It took me weeks of interviews to find out why. And what she said was, because I didn't feel I deserved to be happy. So many people are afraid of bliss and happiness. Because you think you don't deserve it. You do. It's a guilt trip. It's a Western guilt trip. Which stops us being enlightened. Because you say we don't deserve to. If you trust me, and trust Venerable Chandu, and trust even the Buddha, you deserve to be happy. It's okay to bliss out. Deep happiness coming from peace. Just sitting there, doing absolutely nothing. Getting bliss out of your head. And the bliss gets deeper and deeper and deeper. More intense. As all the world falls away. Sometimes people interpret that bliss as love. Unconditional acceptance. Just being here and not needing to change at all feeling totally accepted, you don't need to do anything. And you don't do anything. And just the bliss opens up. Deep, deep, deep happiness. And the Buddha said, especially for the monks and anyone else who's done any study of Buddhism, this is from the Dhammacheta, no, this is from the uh, Pasadika Sutta and the Deka Nikaya. If anyone ever asks you monks, are you addicted to pleasure? You should say, depends what pleasure you're talking about. If it's sensory pleasures, no. But if it's the pleasures of meditation, yes. Answer yes. You say, isn't that dangerous? And the Buddha said, there's only four benefits, four results of being addicted to the deep pleasures of the mind. First stage of enlightenment, the second stage, the third stage, or the fourth stage. It actually leads to enlightenment. This is totally beneficial. There was a gentleman who came to 
Let's last little anecdote before we open up for questions. Who came to the monastery where I'm supposed to be the, the leader sometimes? <laughs> Who was a heroin addict. And he came you know, to try and get off his addiction. Really trying hard. Could you explain to me? Anyone who's addicted, he has to say no a thousand times every day to keep off the addiction. Only needs to say yes once. He's back on again. That's the situation as he described it to me. But he was doing so well. I remember him coming up to me, running to catch me before I was going somewhere else. He said, I never believed, I never thought I could ever say this. He said, the reason for the addiction to heroin was it was just so much pleasure, much better than sexual or orgasm. But he said, heroin is much better than that. But he said, the bliss of meditation is much better than heroin. So I never thought I'd ever say that. But it was. Where does that come from? It comes from stillness. The happiness of peace. So, deep happinesses. More than you can ever imagine. And it's there for you. Whenever you decide to let go and stop striving. Stop changing the world. There we go. Now, time to challenge and question, if you really want to. Any questions? <coughs> when was the Euclidean state of your life? So? When, what, when did you have the happiest day in your life? What, what defines it? What defines it is letting go, <coughs> being peaceful, having nothing to do in the whole world, nowhere to go. There is a problem with letting go, because when you let go, you have to disappear. Because you are the problem, the sense of self. Always need to do something. Another quote which was the graffiti on the wall. I saw this myself in my own eyes in Cambridge. It was also in the philosophy department. They had great graffiti in those days. <laughs> and the graffiti was, um, I sometimes get the first two on this, again that's right, is um, to do is to be. And that was uh, many day count. Jean-Paul Sartre turned it around. Not to do is to be, to be is to do. I don't think it was actually Descartes said, be, to be is to do. And it was uh, Jean-Paul Sartre turned around, instead of to be is to do, he said to do is to be. And the third line was summed up by the famous contemporary American philosopher, do be do be do, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> but what I remember from that, it was the connection between your idea of being and your need to do things. You only exist when you do stuff. That's why it's very scary to stop doing anything at all. Because you feel you're disappearing. You're not there anymore. You're not important when you stop doing things. That's why it's so hard to have the confidence, the courage to not to do anything at all, not even think, just to know, to know without words. I'll prove how easy it is to be aware, alive, without thinking. And the way I'm speaking, there are many pauses between my words. In those gaps, what was going on in your mind? There it was again. You were aware, but not doing anything. There's something very spiritual, deep, 
peaceful, about not talking back at the world, but listening to the world. In silence. But it's challenging. You're losing control. Whoopee! <laughs> so this is one of the reasons why the happiness generated by peace is very challenging. As it says in the Sufi Maka, one of my favourite phrases. The path is, but no traveller on it is seen. You can't travel that path, you can't do it. You disappear. And then the path is as wide as an M was an M25 on a on an evening time when there's no traffic. You can't miss it. Enlightenment is. But no person who enters it. You have to let go, disappear, vanish. And then there's all the peace and happiness in the world. That's why it's challenging. You have to be courageous. Disappear. In other words, as I said in one of my books in the forward, get lost. <laughs> Basic relationship is you know, with yourself, first of all. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, I think uh, a relationship with another person can, can yeah. do those things. Yes. Have you ever noticed relationships with other people are always troublesome? But yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not their fault. It's escapism, that's not solution. No, no it is a problem. to people as uh, I'm relating to you now, you can also disappear. You can vanish. You can have time out. Have a vacation. What does the word vacation mean? To vacate. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is one of the biggest problems with relationships with other people is it reflects the relationship we have with ourselves. You know that this is uh, I just I quote this as a very famous Christian golden rule to love your neighbour as yourself which means to love yourself as your neighbour no more, no less we don't do that we sacrifice ourselves for others we are less important than others and sometimes it's ridiculous we do things like that so what's really important is that you don't love yourself more than others. You love yourself as others. I sometimes uh, get the privilege to bless weddings. <coughs> a blessing wedding. Up there, hi, up there. Sorry? You blessed her wedding. Oh, there you are, yeah, excellent. That's a gay wedding, the first one I blessed. Excellent. But anyway, I remember blessing this wedding of uh, it. Um, uh, many times in Australia, to make the point, I look at the bride first of all, this is a, a heterosexual wedding, look at the bride and say, from now on, you're a married woman and you must never again think of yourself. And she always nods. And look at the, guy, the groom. Honestly, this is anecdotal experience, it's not putting down guys, especially Australian guys. When I look at the Australian guys, I said, now, you are a married man, you must not think of yourself either. And it always takes a few seconds to think it over. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And then, he originally, okay, I agree. And I said, and now you're a married man, you must never think of her from this moment on. 
your wife. And looking at the wife, I said, and you too must not think of him from this time on. This is almost like a koan. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an important new way of looking. So now you're married, you must not think of yourself, you must not think of your partner. From now on, only think of us. The third option, which people miss all the time. If you're married, it's not about you anymore, it's not about your partner. If you just think of yourself, selfish, what type of marriage is that? Just what I can get out of it. Totally selfish. If you think of your partner, then you get burnt out. It's all about him or her, whatever your partner is. There's nothing in it for you anymore. And after a while, it's just so much giving, giving, giving. You don't, you're not part of the marriage anymore. And it's about us. In it together, your individuality disappears. And your partnership. It's about us. So even if I want to disappear, because I, I just want okay. to say, if you are in a relationship, there's an expectation. You, even, even in terms of physics, you have yeah. a relationship between two objects. Oh, it could be broken. Yes, but uh, if, oh, if you decide disappear, to disappear, okay. there's, there, there's no relationship. So oh, yeah. in a way, you abandon this person, you let them down. No, no, I really don't. You take with you, it's for about us. You disappear together. <laughs> Okay, yeah. yeah. I, um, I'm curious about, you were talking about the nun who, who felt that she didn't deserve and that sort of stopped her in yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, getting over the, yes, the last did. bit. Um, and so I'm curious about, I feel like social structures or how we sort of relate in the world and also human goings and human yeah. doings are sort of maintaining uh, what sort of the social structure is uh, putting upon us. So I'm curious, um, what do you think would sort of foster values to, um, to make a collective group or the world feel that they deserve, um, deserve it? Because that, it is a relationship between the collective and the individual and I don't think we, we have learned this and then we sort of adopt that and practice that. So yeah, a lot of times, uh, you know, we know one of the biggest problems is that people say there's not enough resources to go around. So fighting over water, fighting over money, fighting over food, fighting over space to live. So you see so many homeless people in London and people with big houses and so many empty rooms. There is enough to go around if we can only live more simply. But do we measure ourselves with how big our houses are? By how, um, how renovated our kitchen is? By how big our car is? By how many degrees we've got? I'm a bit confused, really. Yeah, so a lot of times what happens is that when people learn how to, now first of all, go from being an individual to be part of things, being a family, and actually working together. Which you now does take means I have to let go of what I want for others. It's called renunciation of my own desires. Renunciation of my own new world, judging other people. I remember learning that when I was used to watch football matches. And so see the people that can't kick a ball, my old granny and she's dead could kick a ball better than you. It's so easy to criticise when you're in the stands watching some other people play. But then later on I would play myself. <coughs> and I was making the same mistakes. And the trouble is that we expect and demand other people to actually to perform really well. And the reason is because we're criticised. Even when I remember at school, if I made a mistake, stupid. So my ego my sense of self was tied up with being perfect, with being an achiever. And I wasn't allowed, it was a personal fault to make a mistake. And so I would hide mistakes. I would hide imperfections. At the same time I never found out, I was criticised, I wasn't good enough. 
And please excuse me, but in my experience, again anecdotal, why do women always think they deserve the blame? Always think they deserve the blame. It's amazing. There's so much guilt complex in other people. You think that there's something wrong with us. Original sin. It should be shared with Adam. Adam Adam's the most poor, not Eve. But that has come down to us in Western culture. And people never feeling that they're good enough. Always need to have to prove a bit more. And this is not something even this holders of Dalai Lama notice. You can understand. Why do people don't think they're good enough? I guess it has to do with maybe past experiences or it doesn't exist in the now, but yeah. um, I mean I don't think I have a bit of a struggle to think about sort of like um, the, you're talking about the, uh, people go on and have a degree and they, they think that's going to bring them happiness and happiness in the, in the future I, I I share that view sometimes, but not always. Yeah. So it's the other example, which I've already repeated once on this, actually just last night. Uh, for people who are stigmatized by physical, so-called deformity, and I do that with, you know, not really liking to say deformity, they're just different. Or with intellectual, so-called disabilities, and I don't agree with that because some of these people are just they're just skilled in so many different areas. Why do we stigmatize people in such a way? And sometimes we stigmatize them early in life. You're a failure. And if a marriage, a relationship fails, you're a failure. And that stigmatizing, I found the best simile which overcomes that is the old simile of the forest, which you've probably heard already. I live in forests in Australia, forest monk. And sometimes I ask people to go out, walk in the forest, and look for a perfect tree. One which is dead straight, there's no such thing. All trees are bent and crooked, with branches having been torn off by the, the storms, with, with damage on the trunks of the trees, bits of bark which have been torn off or burnt in the fires. And quite frankly, and I think you'll all agree with me, the most beautiful trees are the ones which have been twisted and bent with branches fallen off. The damaged ones. And what do we say in our West? Damaged goods. Stigmatized. No way that you can have any happiness. You are being pushed out, you don't belong. We stigmatize so many people, LGBTQIA plus community stigmatized, you don't belong. And many such people, they, they commit suicide. But how to address these issues? Exactly. Because, because this, this idea question. of otherness and this sort of inflexibility of normalness, whatever that exactly. is, so you, which is a huge problem. You get your truth, not from a Buddhist monk, but from the world outside. It's right in front of your eyes when you walk into a forest. There's no such thing as a perfect tree. Every tree is damaged. So number one, if you are damaged, you failed. So you have broken relationships, you've got some so-called mental, physical uh, difference. Number one, you belong. You belong to this wonderful forest called humanity. And you can find also, yeah, that tree, I can relate to that. I, not the same as others. I'm bent, I'm twisted. But more than that, the most beautiful trees, the ones you will go back to again and again, the ones you'll take photographs of and paintings of, they're the ones which are the most twisted and damaged. They're not just belong, but they stand out as the most attractive. Do you Actually, think they have a sorry, yeah. but there's yeah. ten minutes and there's about three or four okay, people yeah. that so I have to okay. say but you do belong. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay, yes. Uh, back, yeah. Go on, yeah. Yes, a general question. Just wondering how the balance what you're saying about uh, letting go, not striving, um, that concept. 
concept against the, the need for human beings to strive in order to improve things, both as individuals, for example, if you want to provide for our families, it needs, you need to work, you need to try and better yourself, okay. you need to, you know, that, that requires <coughs> effort and striving, you know, both as a society, to, to improve things for humanity. For example, advances in medicine and science have greatly improved life on Earth. That requires effort, study, striving, degrees, a whole system. So how do you balance what you're saying about that is a negative thing against yeah. the fact that it's necessary and actually it's part of human progress? Sometimes the assumption we progress, where we progress in material, but in happiness and well-being, well, we're doing, uh, sorry, do we measure by length of life or quality of life? Is the purpose of being here to extend our life more and more and more and more? So we challenge many of these, many of these perceptions. So it is quite radical about sometimes we're rich in things, poor in time, as people keep saying. More mental illness, so to speak, more stress. Yeah, you work very hard and very long to get by, but about the, the little kid waiting for his father to come home from work. And as soon as his father came home, the kid asked, how much do you earn at work per hour, Dad? No, your business aren't tired. And he said, no, no, how many, this is a straight story, how many dollars do you earn at work per hour? Look, I'm just tired, none of your business. Daddy, how much? I three times get to your room, you're grounded. And then the father only got angry because he was tired and stressed. When he had a cup of coffee, relaxed, he felt guilty, so he went up to see his son and said, Son, I don't know why you need to know this, but I actually work uh, twenty dollars an hour. Thank you, Father. Now can I please borrow ten dollars? <laughs> 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 and his father would usually say no. But you know, he'd already argued once and been angry once at his son, so he got out of his wallet, gave him ten bucks. And his son opened the drawer next to his bed and took out ten dollars in coins, counted out twenty. Daddy, can I please have one hour of your time now? So what is progress? So anyway. So I challenge you, you can't answer the question totally. Who's the next one in line? This is one up here. Okay, one up here, how about this? Um, I'm wondering, for people living with mental illness, such as myself, we often struggle to meditate. It's quite difficult because it brings up symptoms of the illness. So for sort of, you know, short periods it's fine, but it's kind of getting over that barrier and doing long periods. And I'm just wondering if there's any advice for that. Again, don't even count the minutes, don't count the hours. So a lot of times we put those barriers in. There's you know, sometimes when we have an idea what meditation should be, that puts another barrier up. So, you know, this, I always thought that as a teacher, the last person I should teach is someone with schizophrenia, because they might become really weird and, and I, I have to look after them, I'm responsible for them, but it depends how you teach. If you teach just to, but what I said at the beginning, the yeah, answer three questions. Now is the most important time. Don't count the minutes and hours. And the most important thing is what you're experiencing now. And just be so kind. So kind. And if you need to get up and go to something else, fine. Kindness. It's beautiful gentleness, which accepts this moment, accept yourself as you are. Don't ever think there's anything wrong on this thing from you. You belong. You're here. And some of those so called there's three monks now uh, under my my monastery teaching. They're all uh, clinical schizophrenics. I never thought it was possible. They're doing a wonderful job. And one of them has been there for a long time. You would never guess that he's on cosopine, a very high dosage doing a wonderful job as a monk. And I was just so proud of him. Just, I like him to sort of come out more and just you know, tell you know, how he has meditated. I can only just you know, second hand tell how he feels and what he does. 
But he's an amazing fellow. One cries up here and he meditates so well. Beautiful monk. It, so I know it's possible. Yeah, so. Oh, actually, you, you have asked a few questions, so I should. Oh, the, yeah, in the middle. Yeah, uh, middle of, who had this one first? Um, the, the man behind you. Okay, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. I was quite intrigued about your, your, your story of when, about when beauty in unusual places and oh, yeah. how the crooked trees are beautiful. But what would you say what beauty is in that sense in, 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 in your world? Is it just awareness, paying attention? Yeah, it's, in other words, I remember one of my fellows who works at CERN, he was an uh, experimental nuclear physicist. And he said, I answered an amazing question for him. What is beauty? It's not in the eyes of the beholder. It's in the energy of the mind which knows. So when you really do get energized, see so much beautiful beauty in so many things. Unexpected. In particular, for those of you who ever do meditation, something like the breath. The breath isn't delightful, beautiful by itself. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually called a chitta sankara. It's how the mind sees it. And it gets so incredibly beautiful. As the mind becomes stronger, you get to the ecstasy states. Now what Christian mystics, St. John of the Cross, Cross Teresa of Avila, started to describe as union with God. In other words, they disappeared. Their sense of self vanished. And they had this beautiful sense of an immersion with this incredible bliss where they didn't exist. Powerful, loving, there's more to it than that. But they were getting somewhere. Ecstasy experiences. It's made of the mind. Always there for you. If you know how to become still. Even this is in Christian book of Psalms. Be still and know that thou art God. What the heck does that mean? From that stillness, from that letting go, the ecstasy, the incredible bliss, which many people, union with God as Buddhists, is the bliss of the jhanas. Stages of disappearance of letting go. Okay, um, Maybe that yeah, if you have asked a question before then, then, which one? Uh, no, you have asked a question before, yeah. Um, this one here, no, this one. Yeah. What I wondered was sometimes, in fact frequently, more often than not, I find the, the, the watching of the breath tyrannical and quite tedious. And are you suggesting in the whole um, idea that we don't have to try so much, or in fact we don't have to try at all, are you suggesting that we could just sit there and let the mind run, run around as much as it wants? No, close. <laughs> if you really do sit there and let go, the mind stops running. I sometimes wondered, why did my mind wander off anywhere? And all the time it's because it was afraid of me. I was a control freak. And it was, it was throwing a tantrum. So one day I decided, okay, you can do whatever you want, right? I'm going to be kind to you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to open the door of my heart no matter what you do. Let my mind stop running. Don't just use force to, to get to peacefulness or whatever. Use wisdom, insight. Why does my mind run? It's got nothing to do. It is a reaction to you being a tyrant to your mind. You said it correctly. So never treat your mind like that. Treat it as a friend, not a slave. And if your mind wants to go off somewhere, fine, I'll be here when you come back. Then it never wants to go anywhere. It stays with you all the time. When you love it. Thank you. Good question. Sorry? It's half past here. Half past here. We do actually, yeah. yeah. You want to say something? Because we've got a train to catch.
newsletter in January, so people will be welcome to come. And we shall have some sittings. I'm not exactly sure what the schedule is going to be yet because it's such a new thing, but um, there'll be something for everybody. You can come off to go to me. I need to eat. And if I'm well fed, then I may be able to offer a little bit more Dharma teaching. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. It will be a centre, basically, a new place where we can meet together and, and share the Dharma. So, really look forward to that. So, thank you for being here. Great. I now go to disappear. <laughs> <laughs>